Mid Journey, Dali, all of these people still have to comply with trademark law, even though they fall into that exception. So if for some reason you were able to get your Picasso that you drew back out of something like Mid Journey, you could then go to them and say, hey, this, this violates uh, copyright law. I'd like to, to file a DMCA takedown or whatever the appropriate uh, thing would be at that point. Today is going to be a very, very cool topic and one that has been asked a lot lately because we're talking about this thing called AI and uh, really what is legal? What are we allowed to use? Are we allowed to create digital art using AI for our designs for print on demand and can we sell them? It's a great question. So I had Chris actually do a little bit of digging this week because, uh, well, he's good at digging and finding out all of the all of the legal terms kind of usually buried down inside of a lot of those documents. So I had Chris do that. And uh, Chris is actually going to go through and share with us what he has learned. And we talked a little bit last week, Scott, about one of our new favorite tools for being able to do a few different things in the print on demand world, which was mid journey, right? Which is one of these AI artificial intelligence, not Adobe Illustrator, right? Artificial intelligence tools that allows us to get more done in less time. Or for somebody like me who has zero design skills. Uh, it allows me to actually be able to create elements, create full designs and create all of those things. And we had some people asking, Hey, you guys previously had talked about the fact that you weren't totally comfortable with it, that some of the, you know, some of the ways that people were using it, you weren't really fans of, and there are always going to be edge cases. But since we've been digging through these tools, we found specifically mid journey that allows us to do all of these kinds of things that we'll be diving into today and kind of talking through, right? It does come down to how you use them and when they're used and all of those kinds of things. But if you're looking for a way to be able to get more done, it's definitely doable. We're going to dive into some of the ins and outs of when and how you should be using these tools and some of those kinds of things today, just to clear up any of those remaining questions. Um, but these are definitely tools. And again, it, it depends on the tool. We specifically are, are fans of mid journey right now. And we'll dive into some of the reasons why, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> as we get further in here, but these are things that can be used in your business. Generally speaking, it just depends on how and, and when you're using them. And if you're looking for a way to come up with something that you can't find otherwise, they definitely have a place in your business. Even right now, as we're kind of wading through the gray area of up and coming technology versus US or UK law, <laughs> which is not the world's sexiest topic, but it's definitely something that we need to, to talk about. And as, Scott, I'm sure you know, law is almost always behind technology. Um, so we'll be oh, diving yeah. into some of, the, some of the, the reasons when and how and all of that fun stuff as we, we work our way through the material here today. Because what we're talking about, super sexy topic, right? Is it illegal uh, to sell AI art designs? What are some of the legal implications? What are some of the things that we need to talk about? especially if we're talking about for Etsy, for print on demand, something like that, right? And so the the question becomes <laughs> who owns these and what's going on? And before we get started, I just wanna make sure that everybody knows, and I knew Scott would get a kick out of this, that neither of us are attorneys. However, we both have the skills to use AI to make ourselves look like one. So in this case, what I did was I just went to mid journey. I uploaded a, a old photo that I found on Facebook of me. And I said, can you make me look like a middle-aged attorney? And this is what came back. So that is proof that we can use AI to make us look like attorneys, whether we are or not, but you don't have to be an attorney to understand the basics of these things. And some of the, you know, some of the very specific questions about if I use this percentage and, and all of those kinds of things, even attorneys don't necessarily know, but we can give you the, uh, the rough guidance. And by covering the three things that we're going to be covering here today, you guys are going to really have an understanding of what are the do's and don'ts to make sure that you stay protected with something like this. So what we actually are going to be covering is three different pieces, right? The first is, is it even legal to use AI to create art, right? Are we just stealing from other people or is this something we can actually do? And then if it is legal, right, who owns it? Do I own it? Does the original person that it took, you know, the eyes from, do they own it? Does Midjourney themselves own it? 
And then if I own it, can I then turn around and sell it? So we're going to cover all three of those things as we're diving in. And like Scott, like you said, if you guys have any questions about this along the way, make sure to ask them because this is sort of a nebulous topic, right? It's not go here, click this button. I know there's going to be some things that come up. And our general guidance on that is if you have that question and you're brave enough to ask it, there's probably 10 or 15 other people who are watching or listening and have that same question, but didn't have the chance or didn't have the ability to ask it. So make sure that as we're working through this, that you ask any questions along the way, we'll save a little bit of time at the end. So the, the first thing uh, is, is it legal? And the, the two arguments that you typically hear against using AI for anything, but specifically for something like a print on demand business is, well, it's cheating because it doesn't involve any skill, right? So Scott, I, I want to address this because this isn't really a legal argument, but it's more of an argument that I hear from designers. Um, specifically, you know, somebody like my cousin who is a professional graphic designer teaches graphic design, right? They say it's cheating because it doesn't involve any skill. And that's not really a legal argument, but it's more of like a, an ethical or, a, <laughs> a, a complaint really. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. would you say it's cheating to buy a doghouse? that's pre-built versus making one because you have zero carpentry skills, right? <laughs> Either way, you end up with a dog house, right? right? And so right. even though even though we might be not giving our local carpenter quite as much business because we're buying a dog house on Amazon and just putting it together with pegs and glue or whatever, right? It's not really any different. So the, the it's cheating argument doesn't really fly with me because just because I don't know how to go into Adobe Illustrator and make something look pretty, doesn't mean that I can't create art, right? There's literally art that sells for millions of dollars that is a blue painted canvas. And Scott, I think you've seen this. It's probably even called blue. And somebody just took a canvas and painted it blue, but because they're a famous artist, right? That is now art and art is subjective. And so to me, that's no different than me creating something using AI, right? Art is subjective. And so it's not really cheating. And quite honestly, it does involve a good bit of skill to get good things back, at least at this point from AI. So let's kind of ignore that for just a second. But the, the second one is it can't be legal because it's built from other people's work, right? And so this is the one that has a little bit more of a leg to stand on, but not really. If you guys aren't familiar with how these systems work, we're going to get kind of nerdy here for a second, Scott. And I don't know if you know how these systems are trained, uh, but essentially what they do is they take millions and millions of images and they then break that down into individual pieces of code. So the easiest way to think about this uh, is if we go back to that blue example, right? A computer out of the box doesn't understand what blue is. It doesn't understand the concept of blue. It doesn't understand that a color is a thing, right? And so what we then have to do to teach a computer what blue is, is take thousands or millions of pictures of something that is blue and tell the computer, this is blue, this is blue, this is also blue, <laughs> right? Until it starts to understand and is able to identify what blue is. And if you guys have ever gone and filled out one of those stupid uh, capture things where it's like, select the stop sign, guess what? Yes, that does help protect forms, but that's also teaching computers what a stop sign is, right? That's literally the point of those things. It helps secure a form, but it also lets a computer start to learn in the background and be able to identify a stop sign or traffic lights or crosswalks or whatever it is that it has you do when you fill out one of those silly things, right? And so what is the exception? If we're taking a photo that somebody else took or we're taking a Michelangelo painting, how is it that we can use a portion of that in this algorithm, well, first of all, it comes, it really comes down to what is called fair use, right? And so there's a bunch of exceptions to copyrights and trademarks, but fair use is the big one. It's also the hardest and most complicated to understand because it really depends, right, on what is and what isn't fair use. But essentially, we're talking about taking the minimal amount, right? So in this case, if we trained it on a million images and one of those happens to be a Picasso, that'd be one one millionth of what this thing is trained on, right? So we're using a very minimal amount of that. And we can't get that Picasso back out, right? So the way that these are designed is actually, they take that Picasso and they break it down into code so that you can't actually then take that Picasso back out of Midjourney or uh, OpenAI's Dolly or any of these other programs, right? And so what this comes down to is what's the fair use and transformation exception to copyright and trademark. And the, the legal ease behind this is, was the material used and transformed by adding new expression or meaning? Well, if it's one one millionth of what this thing understands, and we're not trying to get that exact Picasso back out, but we want something that's in the style or related to Picasso, that is used and transformed, and it's adding new expression or meaning, right? 
The other part of this exception is, was it value added? Was it changed? And the answer is yes. And we can see this with something like Midjourney, Scott, and I know that you have done this, uh, where we take and upload a photo that we have the rights to, right? Just like right here at the very beginning, where I took this photo of me that I own the trademark of, this is a fair use exception to my trademark because it's an artistic interpretation of the original photo, right? And while I'm not going to get into all the ins and outs and when it may or may not be, that is how and why trademark law is, is applied in this. And that's why it's legal to actually be able to use these things to create art. We are not knocking off the original artist. We're using a little bit, the minimum amount of information to create a new interpretation of those things. This is the same reason why Scott and I can both take the same exact prompt into something like Midjourney and get two very different results back out because it's all based on interpretation, right? So now that we understand a little bit about fair use, let's talk about keeping ourselves on the right side of this, right? And there are still ways, like I mentioned at the beginning of this, that we can find ourselves in a more gray area than the very basic non-gray area that we're in to start with, right? We are essentially okay to use this, but we can put ourselves in more of a dangerous situation by doing one of two things. One, if we specifically are trying to create a Picasso and we say something like, do this in the style of Picasso, 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 it's going to start to use more of the Picasso style images that it has uploaded, right? That could potentially get us into a gray area. The other side of this is most of these platforms, specifically something like Midjourney, allow us to upload an inspirational image, right? Something that we want to use that the system can identify and work off of. If we just go to Google and type in stock photos and we don't have the rights to use those images, well, then that potentially could take us into a gray area. Again, not an attorney. You still could probably get away with it because of the fair use exceptions. I just wouldn't recommend that anybody do that, right? There's no reason to upload something that you don't have the rights to. And there's no reason to necessarily say and try to get that Picasso that was uploaded back out of the system, right? If we're using this, we're using this to create our own designs, just steer clear of those two things. And you're going to be on the right side of this. Does this make sense so far, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think bottom line is like you're saying, Chris, and you're kind of painting that picture, <laughs> if you will, of, you know, you have to also understand and use some common sense, right? If you are using something that does not belong to you, then you're running the risk more so, right? Like of there being an issue. But for the most part, we're using commands, prompts, and those are unique to us. But also, even if I use the same, it's not going to give me the same result. So yeah, I, I think it, perfect. Keep going. I love where you're going with this. Yeah. So, so in addition to that, right, all of these platforms do have to enforce existing trademark law, right? They don't just exist in a vacuum. So if for whatever reason you think your work was used or was gotten back out of these types of systems, they all have to have the same exact trademark enforcement as anybody else would, right? It's the same reason you hear about Etsy occasionally taking down somebody's store because they were listing Disney stuff right? Midjourney, Dolly, all of these people still have to comply with trademark law, even though they fall into that exception. So if for some reason you were able to get your Picasso that you drew back out of something like Midjourney, you could then go to them and say, hey, this, this violates uh, copyright law. I'd like to, to file a DMCA takedown or whatever the appropriate uh, thing would be at that point. So they do still have to comply with that. The stuff that they're giving you is an exception to any of the stuff that was used to include it, right? So if, if it's legal to create, that then begs the question, Scott, who owns it and who actually creates it, right? Like if, if I'm not the one doodling on a page, is it the same thing as me doodling on a page or is it something else? And the answer is it depends. And just to, to make Scott laugh yet again, I went to ChatGPT just to see uh, if ChatGPT knew anything about me. And I asked it why I constantly say it depends. And they said, you know, it he says it in response to a bunch of different questions and situations because usually there's a bunch of multiple factors, right? Then they go into a whole marketing analogy, which cracks me up because ChatGPT knows that we occasionally talk about digital marketing, right? So the fact that it associated that made me laugh. But the answer is it depends. And it depends on three main factors. The first is which platform is used, right? Some of the platforms, including Midjourney on their, their free plan, and if you create any images publicly, right? So if you just go into their main feed and you create images, they own some rights to those images. Uh, 
it also depends on the platform itself, right? Dali has a different agreement than Midjourney. Midjourney, generally speaking, they say we share the the ownership rights of that. Right. The third thing here is, was the work entirely created by AI? And this is a court case, Scott, that came down, I believe it was about two weeks ago, as of the time of recording this, about a comic book where the art was completely created by Midjourney specifically. And essentially what the court decision said was the work as a whole. So the comic book, you can have the copyright on and own. The images you can sell. That's fine. But if somebody wanted to take that image from the cover, just the image, not the text, not the entire work right? And they wanted to use it because it wasn't created by a human. If they had a way of getting that original image, then yeah, they could, right? So you own anything that you compile with AI and you own anything that you create, but you can't necessarily trademark or copyright a compilation the same way that you could if you hand drew all of the elements. So if we hand illustrated this comic book, we would have the rights, right? To resell it just like we do here. And we would have the rights to trademark and copyright and prevent that image from being distributed in any way that we didn't like. In the case of something like AI, currently, we can sell it, we can distribute it. But if somebody wanted to take that image and put it on a t-shirt, they technically could do that, right? And so where that kind of leaves us is in kind of an interesting situation in terms of the ownership of these images, right? If I use Midjourney to create a compilation to put on my, my t-shirt, right? I can sell it. That's fine. I can put it on that t-shirt, but I don't own a copyright or a trademark to it the same way I would if I created it inside of Adobe Illustrator, for example, right? If, however, I go into something like Midjourney and I create the barn and the chicken, and then I use something like Canva to put them together into that image that we see in the bottom right-hand corner, which is just a barn or a chicken standing in front of a barn, which is the same thing I asked Midjourney to create to begin with, then I have more ownership and more ability to trademark and copyright that, right? And so if it's possible for somebody to find that image in Midjourney, and could they also put it on a print-on-demand t-shirt on Etsy? Technically, yes. Right. But if we compile those different elements and then create that, that then becomes no different than anything else that we would create. Does that make sense, Scott? Either way, we have the, the right to it. It's just how open that right is for other people to potentially use. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it makes 100% sense. And, you know, I think to your point, like we can create full on designs that were created from AI. And technically we have some ownership in that because we've created it with our own prompts with, and like you said, like millions and millions of data points that are being thrown out there and kind of brought together, which we don't, I don't really understand how that all works, but it does it right. And then we have ownership of that because we created it with our hands, but yet we didn't draw it. Right. It's kind of like someone with a, you know, that paints with, uh, you know, an iPad, right? Well, someone might be a good painter there, but it might not be as good a painter on paper, but they choose to use that. So they're using technology to basically take what's here and put it here. Now, if you don't have the design skills, but you have like a decent eye for what looks good, then you can somewhat create that, right? Um, and then the other side of it is being able to create components, right? Like, let's say that you wanted to create like that that chicken scene there that Chris created, right? It's like you create the chicken, you create the barn, you might create a cow, and then you take them all together and compile them. And now that's your own image. It's very, very uh, similar to what uh, Kittle is allowing people to do, where it's taking a graphic designer and they're making designs come into this one platform. And then people can kind of piggyback off of each other and use components from each other from their designs but they can't sell the design as a whole by it's because it's, it wasn't compiled. So yes, um, I think it's great. And I think also just to kind of like, like you did there, Chris, in your picture in that little slide with you as the attorney, we are not attorneys. So what we are saying is just what we are interpreting from what we're reading and what we're seeing and all of that stuff. I will say uh, Shutterstock has their own AI and they have other rules and regulations in there about what they're, they're more or less staying clear of it. As I noticed, Midjourney is kind of went a little bit deeper and kind of dug through and said what they feel 
is the legal side of it. So you do have to figure out what platform you're using and kind of look at their terms of service. Yeah, and it is it is going to vary. But if you're specifically looking to create either elements or whole designs, everything that we've played with so far, Midjourney is the best, which is why I'm using their terms as the examples, because we can't go through all 900 different platforms. And there's a new one coming up every day, right? So you are going to want to take a look at that. Um, and where you will find that is actually the thing that's that's coming up next here, Scott, uh, which is, can you sell this stuff? And the answer is, it depends on two things, right? Which platform are you using? Some of them do not allow you to sell it, right? And you have to look at what's called the usage rights or the license agreement. Um, and some of them do allow you to sell. So these are the plans, like the paid plans for MidJourney. And if you look under their free trial, which is not really a trial, uh, <laughs> it just, you know, you can create as much as you kind of want there. Um, you just can't then turn around and sell it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, as soon as you move to a paid plan, they move to a commercial agreement. So you have the ability to sell and use those things any way that you want. They do still reserve the rights, right? To have other people be able to use that work, just like we talked about in the court case, because if it's created publicly on something like Midjourney, other people can remix it. They can do other things with it and use that as the foundation of their work then right? Just like you're using the millions or hundreds of millions of images that this thing was trained on, right? To create your new piece of work, every new piece of work that's created inside of Midjourney, uh, and this applies to the other platforms as well, is then used to create further work. Does that make sense? And so mm -hmm. they reserve some rights to it. They can't sell it. They can't do those kinds of things, but they can still use that as inspiration and as something that other people can work off of even on the paid plan. Uh, the other thing is when you move to a paid plan with something like Midjourney, and I, I mentioned this a couple minutes ago, Scott, they have what they call stealth mode uh, on their, their pro plan, which means it's not available publicly anywhere. That doesn't necessarily mean that somebody still wouldn't get a portion of that if they type in some of the same keywords and some of those kinds of things. But it does kind of keep it out of the public eye, which just means it's less likely to be used. So right. if you're really worried about someone taking something that you created in mid journey, you can always upgrade to their, their pro plan and move into something like self mode. But Scott, you and I were talking about this the other day and we said, you know, even if you can't trademark the full design that you created the same way that you could uh, if you drew it by hand, is that really a big deal? Because unless somebody's going in and just straight up ripping you off uh, because they find that exact image, they're never going to get the same result back out. So is it really something that we have to worry about? And the answer is not really, <laughs> right? Like unless you're an IP attorney, the ability for other people to like see and use that stuff shouldn't really concern you, at least in my mind. If you're focused on creating designs and creating design elements or creating product mockups using this, the fact that it exists in a nebulous system somewhere and somebody somewhere might be able to find the chicken that you created at some point and use it right. for something else. That's not like your IP, <laughs> right? Anyway. Right. And as a small business owner, you, even if you did own all of the rights to it, you probably couldn't afford the attorney that you would need to enforce right. that anyway. So <laughs> it's not really a concern. And if we're focused on creating those elements and those designs using something like this, as long as you are in a paid plan, right, with something like Midjourney or another tool that allows you commercial rights, the commercial ability to use this, and it's not under a Creative Commons license, which is usually the, the free license that they use, uh, then you are okay to create it, to use it, and to sell it inside of something like an Etsy print-on-demand business. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, you know, right now, it's new, right? Like I say new, it's been out for a little while, but it's becoming more mainstream. And I think also now we have to start looking at, okay, what are the rules? What are the laws? What is the, what is the, the legal side of these things? And all we can do is really read through the documentation. And that's why we wanted to do this today for you guys is really have Chris kind of dig in, see what it's saying and kind of break it down for what we understand it to be used as, but also to kind of use some common sense because the way I look at it is if I'm taking something that uh, does not belong to me, right? And then selling that, well, that's, that's a problem, right? Well, how can I make my design my design, right? And 
to me, the way to do that is come up with some really good prompts. Okay. Everything is driven by prompts, commands, as they call it. Right. So we want to have good prompts. Think of your prompts and the image that you might be using as a reference image. Think of that as making that project, that design even more unique to yourself.